Hi, my name is Carmen Willings, and today I'd like to share strategies and tips for being a physically fit TBI. Help but make parallels between recommendations I was reading for getting in shape with recommendations for growing in your career as a TBI. I decided it would be fun to play off those parallels, which is why today's theme is becoming a physically fit TBI. As I was researching strategies, the same recommendations kept rising to the top. Those included getting your mind right, strength training, eating with your goals in mind, knowing that it takes time, and ultimately ways to bulletproof yourself. Everyone says the most important step is to first get your mind right. This is important for weight loss, but also for setting any goals. You need to first do the mental and physical prep work so you can be the professional you want to be. You can start anytime, but the best time to start getting your mind right is at the beginning of the school year when you're naturally getting organized and setting your professional goals for the year. The steps you make now will help ensure you have a smooth if you've been an itinerant teacher for long, you know that it is imperative that you learn how to manage your time. The way to manage your time is to make schedules and allow for wiggle room and flexibility. Such is the life of an itinerant teacher. I see my schedule as a puzzle with moving parts or on a board with sticky notes. You need to find the balance between creating and following a schedule and being able to respond to needed adjustments and changes. I left the classroom and became an itinerant teacher in 2003. Even though I've been itinerant for the past 16 years, I still need a beginning of the year and end of the year checklist to make sure I haven't forgotten any tasks. I created this one page checklist entitled Year at a Glance Checklist. I have it as a free printable on my website if you'd like to use it too. I list out the office tasks that need to be completed as well as those tasks that need to be completed at the different schools I travel to. I also include mid-year and end-of-year tasks on the sheet. I'll be going over each task that is identified on the list and the strategies I use to complete them. Before I start going over the beginning of the year tasks, I think it's important to discuss list making. I think the foundation of keeping your mind right is to maintain a to-do list. My brain can be much like spaghetti and writing out all my tasks and grouping them into categories helps me to stay organized and get my brain straight. Like you, there are many projects I always have going, but it's important to prioritize and take care of time sensitive ones first, which means my list is fluid and things move to the top based on critical need. I tend to be old school and make paper lists simply because I find it cathartic to cross off items that I've completed. Of course, then I have to create new lists because of the messy list drives me nuts. Even though I'm old school, I utilize technology too. I love calendar reminders and asking Siri to remind me to do something when I get back home or back to the office. I maintain working folders for each student on my caseload. I purchase folders with prongs during back to school sales and make sure I have students most current IEP, functional vision and learning media assessment, orientation and mobility evaluation, and low vision evaluation. I include all eye reports I have on file as doctor's impressions can change from year to year and it's helpful to maintain copies that may include different diagnoses. It's also helpful to see any progression in changes of acuities. I also include any AT evaluations and extended loan forms in the folder and any other miscellaneous forms including consents and reports. During pre-planning, when I'm gathering student schedules and bell schedules, I collaborate with each case manager and teacher to determine possible times to work with each student. I generally try to schedule my students that are following the standard course of study first, as their schedules tend to have the least amount of flexibility. Once I have those times set, I schedule my students that are following a modified course of study. In my district, we are strongly encouraged to see the most students on what is identified as federal count days as it is tied to funding. So I try to see as many students on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I try to prevent the dreaded no-shows by coordinating with teachers and parents and asking them to let me know if a student is absent. If a student is frequently absent and the teacher has a track record of not letting me know about the absence, I will text ahead of time to make sure the student is present. 
I also check schedules with teachers at the beginning of the month to find out if there are any known assemblies or field trips that would prevent me from seeing the student. Know that there will be no shows and try to have a backup plan and have work that you can complete in a location you can work in so the time isn't completely wasted. As far as scheduling my lunch, it's important to know the program policies on how long a lunch break is. Some programs I've worked for have allowed me to work through lunch and leave early, which is nice, especially when my kids were young, as it gave me flexibility for being able to pick them up from school. As you're filling in your schedule, it's important to know when to ask for help. Prior to doing so, it's important to ensure that you are providing the correct amount of service for each student on your caseload. Are you under or over serving the student? My favorite tool for determining if I'm providing the right amount of service is the Texas School for the Blind's Visual Impairment Scale of Service Intensity. Of all the tools I've used, I think this one captures the student's needs for direct service and consultation the best. It is best practice to complete it annually as you are determining the amount of service on an IEP. If you are the only vision professional in your district, this tool can also be used and it can be very helpful for justifying service and the need for additional TVIs. As you're completing the service intensity scale, it's important to ensure you are adhering to your role. Remember, your role is to teach the ECC and not to tutor students in areas of the core curriculum. You are doing the student a disservice if you offer to teach subject areas in which you are not highly qualified. Also, remember your role is to orchestrate the ECC. You will need to prioritize areas and collaborate with team members to ensure all areas of the ECC are addressed throughout the day. The ECC's essential book, pictured here, has a great section on adherence to one's role on page 519. One of my favorite quotes from the passage is, the role of the teacher of students with visual impairments is to work with the educational team to make sure that appropriate accommodations and considerations are in place. Sometimes it may help to remember that if the student were not visually impaired and were struggling academically, his or her parents, classroom teachers, and administrators would work together to find solutions. It goes on to say, in life and in school, it is impossible to play every role. Teachers of students with visual impairments need to be a positive role model of self-determination by knowing their roles and how to implement it. Circling back to schedules, keep in mind that you need to be flexible and adjust for meetings and appointments outside of the typical schedule. In addition to my printed weekly schedule, I maintain an old-fashioned planner. I pencil in my regular appointments and add my meetings. To draw my attention to the meetings and appointments that are outside of my routine, I usually place a cloud around them and make, to make them stand out. I also use the calendar reminders and invitations for meetings on my phone. I use this planner to document my travel between schools as well. I place a number of miles between schools and the total miles for the day. This makes my monthly travel form easier to complete. If a student cancels and it was a no-show, I cross out the student's name and I write a NS. This is my way of indicating I drove to the school, but I didn't work with the student, but I can still claim that mileage. At the beginning of the year, I go through my students and I write on the side of each month when the IEPs and reevaluations are due so I can better anticipate them. I like to quickly assess if my student has had any changes in vision over the summer. If I am adding a new student to my caseload and I'm not familiar with them, I usually conduct an informal functional vision and learning media assessment as a means to get to know them and understand their vision. If any of my students are due for reevaluation or will be transitioning to a new school or program at the end of the school year, I like to get an early start on the evaluation. Other team members will also be needing to complete their evaluations and they will want the results of the functional vision evaluation prior to conducting their piece. Also, I like to begin early if I know the student will need to attend a low vision evaluation. It can take time to schedule these appointments and they will want the information contained within your report, oftentimes before they will schedule the appointment. 
Because the beginning of the school year is the best time to get organized, I'm going to share the strategies and tips I use at the beginning of the year to ensure a smooth start. We teach our students organizational skills as part of the ECC, but it's difficult to teach this skill if we aren't ourselves organized. That being said, it's important to remember that everyone will have their own system. You need to find what works for you, which is what we teach our students. Hopefully, your system doesn't look like the desk pictured here that is covered in paperwork and food and drink containers. This picture was actually taken at my school, but I won't share the teacher's name. If you are a returning teacher, hopefully you did a lot of work at the end of last school year to help yourself out. Even when you do, you never know when a student may move over the summer and a new student could be added to your caseload. For this reason, I use I first started creating VI program handbooks when I worked for the Wake County Public School System when I lived in Raleigh, North Carolina. I was a 12-month employee, and during the summers, I, along with one of the other 12-month TBIs, was tasked with cre creating a handbook that would be ready for returning TBIs at the end of summer break. We would update it each summer to ensure it contained current information. I continued to update and revise the handbook as I moved to other states and programs as a means to keep myself organized and on top of policies and procedures. I use a one inch binder and eight tab sections and I have listed here the different sections that I have. In the first section, I include employee information such as how to log on to work platforms at home, policies and procedures for attending conferences, and emergency procedures. I also include my workday calendar and student calendars if they are different. I also include a map of the schools and the districts as well as leave forms. In the second section, I include VI program contacts along with special education department chairs, facilitators, data clerks, support staff, and any other district contacts I may need to contact. In the third section, I include my caseload at a glance. I'll go over that more in detail later in the presentation. I also include an all student caseload that I can reference if there are any questions related to other students in the district and who is serving them. The fourth section is where I compile the VI program procedures. I include both state information and district policies that are helpful to reference. The fifth section is where I keep information on a one of the first things I do each school year is to create a caseload at a glance chart. Here I have an example of my caseload with personal identifiable information blacked out, which is why it looks a little funny here. <laughs> this is a quick reference of all the information I need in one location. It consists of a chart with a row for each student and five columns titled student information, school information, team information, VI service and AT, and medical information. In the student section, I include the student's name, date of birth, what type of curriculum they are following, their grade, parent's name, address, and contact numbers and emails. In the school section, I include the school name, address, phone and fax number, hours, the department chair, facilitator, special ed administrator, data clerk, and receptionist. I can't tell you how many times these reference lists have saved me as I'm horrible at remembering names. In the team section, I include the IEP due date, reevaluation due date, primary and secondary areas of eligibility, case manager, any therapist that works with the student, and the classroom teachers. And if it's an academic student and they're in high school, next to the classroom teachers, I'll also write what subjects they teach. In the VI service and AT section, I list the VI and o and service time listed in the IEP as well as assistive technology the student uses. And in the medical section, I write the date of the most recent eye report, ophthalmologist or optometrist name, visual diagnoses, the corrected visual acuity, whether the student qualifies for quota funds, and the student state ID number. 
Laws and state and district interpretations of laws change regularly. It is important to attend and participate in policy sharing meetings at state vision conferences so you know the latest policies and procedures. It is helpful, if not necessary, to review the policies at the beginning of each school year and make any changes based on information shared from the Department of, Department of Education and district administrators. I have found it helpful to pull the information and wording from procedure manuals so I'm sure to, that it is accurate and I can reference policies and procedures in meetings using the correct terminology and having a cited source. This is particularly helpful if you have any contentious or litigious meetings. In my VI handbook, I keep quick reference charts, or what I call cheat sheets. <laughs> These are charts full of information that I can quickly reference either in IEP meetings or when working with students. I include braille contraction checklists, a print comparison chart, print size examples, a pictorial tutorial on how to make enlarged copies that can be mounted next to a copy machine, uh, I include screen sharing directions, iPad accessibility references, keyboard shortcut keys, and a Google Read and Write quick reference. At the end of each school year, I update each student's unique visual needs handout for the upcoming year. If you didn't do this at the end of last school year, you will want to do this as soon as possible so you have the handout ready to give to each classroom teacher. I include my contact information, my role as a TVI, a brief summary of the student's visual impairment, and a bolded list of accommodations with keywords in bold to help make it scannable. Teachers don't always have access to IEPs and they appreciate a list of accommodations. Make sure the accommodations match up to the current IEP and functional vision evaluation. I have had my students start creating their own presentations about their vision. I email this to teachers at the beginning of the school year, and it's a great way for the teacher to meet the students and learn about the students' needs directly from the student. Keep the recorded presentation to under five minutes so teachers can quickly watch it during pre-planning. Provide a copy to the student so the student can share as they would like with family, coaches, youth leaders, and peers. This is a great activity to use to help students understand their accommodations and the use of their tools. It also provides them practice in self-advocacy and giving an elevator speech. Be sure to introduce yourself to any new parents using a letter, phone call, email, or schedule a meeting. Don't forget to also touch base with families that you will continue to work with. Check in with them and ask them how their summer was, if there were any changes in vision or events that would be helpful to know about, and if they have any concerns about the upcoming year. Let them know that you've provided information to the new teachers, so hopefully there will be a smooth transition. Assure them that you are available if there are any problems. At the beginning of the year, you want to be sure you have current data collection forms that align with the student's current IEP goals and objectives. I use different formats depending on how the objectives are written. I may use checklists or write out notes depending on how it's written. Recently, I developed Braille practice sentences around ECC concepts. I provide the student with a Braille copy and keep a print and SIM Braille copy and make notes of errors directly on the sheet. I also use forms to work on developing a consistent signature. Prior to reading the passage, I have the student sign off on the data form and I maintain it for my records. For students developing efficiency with using a video magnifier, I created visual efficiency worksheets for the student to complete and then I keep these worksheets for data collection. As I'm visiting schools during pre-planning and when visiting a new school with a referral, I make sure to pick up a copy of the school map from the front office. I keep this in my data collection binder for quick reference and I'm sure to note where the school bathrooms are located. I talk with the receptionist, teachers and media center specialists on where I can store materials to reduce the amount of materials I need to transport between schools. I also note where the copy machines are located and whether I need to have a copy code to use them. Know where the teacher workrooms are located and what resources are available for your use, including die cut machines and laminators. Find out if there are any certain areas that you need to park and where you can park to avoid car rider lines. Respect reserved parking spaces and know that numbered spots mean they are assigned. 
Be sure to know the emergency plans and evacuation procedures too. Finally, but perhaps most important, it can be helpful to schedule many trainings with certain teams. If a student has a video magnifier that they will be using in the room, it's helpful to demonstrate how it works and the features it offers. You will want to help the teachers locate the ideal location to position the equipment and determine important environmental considerations and also consider the student's positioning and comfort. It can be helpful to have the teacher use the device so they will have first-hand experience using it. This can give them an appreciation for it. If a student will need alternative educational materials, you will want to meet with the teachers to provide them with any accessible materials you've ordered and determine the best way to send worksheets or work to you that need to be adapted. It can be helpful to demonstrate how you produce the adapted materials so the teachers can gain an appreciation of the time it takes to produce such things as braille and tactile graphics. As you're organizing your materials, don't forget to set up your car and develop a strategy to keep it clean and organized. I included a few tips and strategies here that I follow. I used to keep materials stored in my car, but I really try not to do that as it just tends to get cluttered and I need the room for groceries. In the front, I keep a USB charger that can convert to a wall charger, office supplies including a Sharpie, small scissors, pens, pencils, and a notepad, hand sanitizers, tissue, spare change, and handy wipes. I have a GPS and I have a small territory now, but when I was the only TVI for a large county, I kept a county map in the car in the event of detours. And yes, there's been times when the GPS in my car went out, so that was good to have that as a backup. I like to prepare for all weather events and don't always remember to add and remove seasonal items. So I just keep an ice scraper, umbrella, and blanket in the car at all times. Of course, I have safety items and a first aid kit in the trunk, but I also keep Some districts have a set chart on allowable miles between schools. If your district doesn't have one, create a cheat sheet of the routes you commonly travel and the miles. This will make the end of the month travel log easier to complete. As I said earlier, I used to have a large territory and spend a lot of time traveling. Take advantage of those times to be productive, but not distracted. I would listen to podcasts, think about my lesson plans, mentally prep for meetings, or just sing my heart out. Give yourself enough time to allow for traffic and be sure to know backup routes if there is construction or roads are closed. Every program I've worked for has required teachers to complete an annual self-assessment and professional plan on strengths and areas of need. It's rare to have a self-evaluation tool specific to itinerant teachers in our roles as TBIs. Most evaluation tools can be tailored to our roles, though. I did create a self-evaluation rubric and checklist that is reflective of our roles that you are welcome to use. I used information from teacher assessments I had used in several states and made it applicable to our world. Rather than dreading annual assessments, view it as a time to justify the specialized vision-specific trainings you need. Documenting the professional development activities you participate in throughout the year, as well as documenting your achievements, can be rewarding to look back on at the end of the year. Instead of writing individual goals, or in addition to them, you may decide to write a team goal towards implementing the national agenda. You can work on this goal as a group project, but you don't have to have a large VI program to implement the national agenda. You can implement it even if you are a VI program of one. I created this checklist as a way to ensure I was doing everything I could do. It is broken down into 10 goal areas. The areas include timely referral process and child find efforts, parent participation, supporting personnel preparation programs by being willing to mentor students in those programs, making sure students are receiving the appropriate amount of service through caseload determination, as well as making sure administrators understand your role, and advocating for more vision professionals when needed, providing an array of services, providing quality and timely assessments, providing students access to instructional materials in accessible formats, instructing students in all areas of the ECC, transition planning that includes coordinating with voc rehab agencies, and finally, professional development opportunities specific to visual impairments. Reflect on what goals you want to accomplish for the year. 
Just like you need to write SMART goals for your students, be sure to write SMART goals for yourself. Be specific about what you want to accomplish and make sure they are measurable, achievable, and relevant to your growth as a vision professional. As you are deciding on a goal, be sure to find your why. For example, if your goal is to be more organized, why? So you're less scattered, stop wasting time trying to locate materials, and are prepared for your lessons. Your goal may be to avoid litigation by becoming better at conducting evaluations and keeping better documentation. Your goal may be to stop fearing referrals by becoming knowledgeable in an area you are less comfortable with or working with a certain disability group. Or your goal might just be to stop bringing home so much work by managing your time better. In addition to getting your mind right, getting fit includes strength training. When you think of strength training, you may think of full body workouts, high intensity interval training or circuit training when you focus on a certain area of your body, going to the gym and working out at home. As vision professionals, our full body workout would be working on becoming knowledgeable in all areas of the ECC and being sure we stay current on best practice. High intensity interval training would relate to honing your skills in one particular area. For example, working with students with cortical visual impairment, knowing different forms of assistive technology, braille instruction, or working with students with multiple disabilities. As vision professionals, our version of going to the gym is like going to a conference where we can be trained by experts. But we can't go to the gym every day, so we need to learn to work out at home, which means practicing the skills we learned from the experts. Because we are such a small field and you may be the only vision professional in your area, it is important to be knowledgeable in the field. Although it's good to have a network and be a part of a social networking group for vision professionals and to have a VI team you can contact, you may not always have a vision colleague you can ask for help or that has the answer. It's okay to not have all the answers. I've been in the field for over 20 years and I still don't have all the answers. If you don't know, you need to find out. Find someone who is willing to mentor you, research in professional books and online, build your resource library and research so you can become an expert. Make it a priority to attend conferences and stay current in best practice and participate in webinars or on-demand workshops. When you're reflecting on areas in which you need to grow, it's helpful to review the annual needs consideration. Pictured here is an annual needs consideration checklist that I developed. I pulled it from existing resources in our field and grouped areas and added sections for recording dates. You're welcome to use this tool and it's available for free as a printable on my website. When you're selecting areas in which you need to grow, remember it's okay to have areas of passion, but make sure you are well-rounded and able to meet the needs of all the students on your caseload and know what is needed at the different ages and stages. The Texas School for the Blind developed the QPVI tool that is great for balancing caseloads if you work on a team. They recommend maintaining a diverse caseload not only to balance caseloads, but to ensure that each TVI maintains skills needed to serve a diverse caseload. Listed here are key recommendations. Each TVI should work with at least one Braille student when possible. Caseloads should be clustered, meaning one TVI serves students within a school. Equalize hours of service. Each TVI serves a wide age range. All TVI serve students with severe and profound disabilities, and all TVI serve students who use low vision devices. This formula currently represents my caseload, and I love it. It challenges me to develop lessons and activities for a broad range of students, and clustering students minimizes travel, which allows more. Brown bag sessions are a corporate term, otherwise known as lunch and learn. These sessions are ideal for teams, but you can think outside the box by joining larger VI teams or by utilizing video conferencing. Your team can identify areas you would like to learn and team members select which topics to present to the team. In this way, you can learn from each other's strengths and get experience presenting to an audience. 
may feel frustrated that you don't always have access to vision-specific trainings, remember, there is always something that can be learned from attending trainings, even if they are outside our field, and from collaborating with team members. I've listed some common roles in the school where you can learn tips and strategies. You can learn leadership and presentation styles from administrators. Administrative assistants may be able to help teach you how to create documents in formats you are less familiar, such as using Excel or creating fillable PDF documents. Classroom teachers can give you ideas for classroom management and using different instructional platforms. Speech and language pathologists can give you strategies on social communication and language skills. OTs can teach you tips for developing fine motor skills, visual perception skills, and visual motor skills. PTs can teach you positioning strategies. The third strategy that most experts will say is important is to eat with your goals in mind. So what are you consuming? Experts will say, we all need protein, so go for the meat. When attending conferences, prioritize which sessions you'll attend. If there is an expert in the field, don't miss out on their presentation. Many of the experts in our field are nearing retirement age, so be sure to pick their brains before their final swan song. I have pictured here a picture of me with Ike Presley, who recently retired from the field. Many of you may know that Ike was our field's AT guru and co-authored the book on assistive technology evaluations. Ike lives in the Atlanta area, so I had the opportunity to get to know him at conferences. I always made a point of attending his workshops, as they were always engaging and packed full of information. Your next priority should be in attending sessions that meets the immediate needs of your caseload. Next would be sessions in an area you feel is a weakness, followed by sessions that you just seem that seem like they would be fun. If you're attending with a team, be sure to divide and conquer and then plan to information share at a team meeting, preferably soon after the conference when you're still energized and the information is fresh in your brain. One more note about Ike. He would say I have way too many words on my slide. I love that he would give me constructive feedback, but was always kind as well. I love the nickname he gave me at the 2018 Georgia AER conference. The Vision Field's Big Sister. We all know that calories count, so be sure to get the most bang for your buck. Because caseloads can be so diverse, it is ideal to use activities and materials that are age neutral and can be used with students at a wide range of ability levels. To do this, I use real objects and teach with themes to incorporate ECC concepts. Not only does that make activities age neutral, it also makes them fun. I build on prior experiences and knowledge and always select activities that will prepare the student for upcoming transitions and environments. When writing goals and objectives, I write them for ECC areas that I know will take longer to work on depending on the student. Here I've listed those areas including concept development activities around object characteristics and quantity and numbers, modes of communication, spatial and body awareness, sensory efficiency activities, activities of daily living and completing job tasks, and activities for developing keyboarding skills and proficiency in using low vision devices. Because I work on these activities longer, I like to find ways to work on the goals but change up the materials or how it is presented by incorporating unit related materials or concepts. When I was writing the TVI's Guide to Teaching the ECC, I included activities to address each of these core areas. Then in the theme sections, I have recommendations on how to adapt for each thematic unit to keep things interesting. We all know the importance of incidental learning, and while we need to be flexible and adjust our plans to be responsive to each student's needs and teachable moments, we also need to systematically plan. Too often, teachers use incidental learning as a license to not plan and fly by the seat of their pants. The art of teaching the ECC is to find a balance, systematically plan to embed ECC skills and adjust and respond to take advantage of teachable moments. Pictured here are two checklists that I created that are resources and a part of my book, The TVI's Guide to Teaching the ECC. The one provides a quick overview of the ECC concept areas, and the other provides a checklist of ECC activities so you can pace yourself and keep track of which activities you've introduced with each student.
I've used themes to teach since I taught in the preschool program. Without the use of themes to change things up, the students would get bored, and so would I. Varying materials help students stay interested and engaged in activities. I selected themes that are naturally occurring, such as just as it's wise to plan your meals ahead of time, you should prepare materials ahead of time. There are always times throughout the school year that seem particularly busy and other times when you have extra time for planning. Help yourself out by planning ahead for upcoming units. You won't be able to create everything at once, but if you have a list of activities you'd like to create, if you have a cancellation, you'll know the perfect activities to fill that time. I use vocabulary cards related to ECC units for many activities. I print them out ahead of time on braille paper, braille the cards, and cut them out and put them in unit bags so they're ready to just grab and go. I print out multiple copies of worksheets so I don't have to worry about a printer that is jammed, out of ink, or otherwise unavailable. I also create task box that I can grab and bring with me. Pictured here is an example of the vocabulary cards along with a number match activity I developed to help one of my students who was having a difficult time identifying the numbers on a tactual dice. I placed raised dots on APH tactile connections cards and created print and number squares to match the cards. I was able to use this with her and other students as well. I take full advantage of APH funding for my students. There are certain products that are my favorites and I use for multiple activities. I used to think I could only use the products for the ages and recommended uses and I'd feel guilty about using them in different ways and with different age groups. I was delighted to learn when I attended the APH annual meeting in 2018 that they encourage professionals to use materials in unconventional ways. Who knew? So don't be afraid to think outside the box with ways you can use these great resources. Pictured here are some of my favorites, including the Tactile Connection Cards, Setting the Stage Kit, and the Wheatley Shapes and Board. Here are examples of the types of visual efficiency worksheets I included in the Visual Efficiency Grab and Go Workbook. While the types of worksheets are similar across units, I changed the picture icons or words to tie them into the theme. I print out and store the worksheets by unit and make multiple copies so they're ready to grab and go. I also keep a copy on a flash drive. I can then present the worksheets on an interactive board and it becomes a way for the student to practice monocular use. I created print-on-demand word lists, phrases, and sentences to correspond with each thematic unit. When working on Braille fluency, I create an embossed Braille copy for the student and use the print and SIM Braille copy for data collection on any errors. I enter these passages into the APH Talking Typer program for students who have learned the keys but need practice building fluency. Rather than typing the same lessons that are included in the program, I create my own lessons using words, phrases, and sentences related to the current theme with a maximum of 10 sentences. This way, the student practices keyboarding skills while learning concepts. This also opens up points of discussion that may otherwise be challenging to naturally discuss. If you aren't sure of how to create custom lessons in Talking Typer, I created a picture tutorial of how to do just that. I've embedded a link to the directions here. Rather than bringing a therapy box or bag to classrooms, I like to set up interactive vision areas for students in severe and profound disability rooms. One of my pet peeves is to see students positioned in a wheelchair without a tray with nothing to interact with. I try to collaborate with the teacher to find an area of the room where we can set it up and the student can go there during down times and have materials to interact with. I like using the Help Kids Learn website with a switch interface so the student can activate the games. I also use the power link from APH and have it attached to string lights along with APH Invisiboard or suspend reflective materials and have a fan be activated that blows the materials. I've also created interactive stories that can be scaffolded to meet needs of the different students. I incorporate sounds, smells, real objects, and physical interactions. I record the stories using PowerPoint and save it as a slideshow. The student turns the page by activating the switch. I either present the corresponding objects or activity or encourage the student to scan to locate the object or matching picture. 
By using objects from the Setting the Stage kit, I already have thermoform shapes and raised line shapes for students who are working on matching and tactile discrimination. I have created a number of task box to use with my students. I like using these activities as there is a clear beginning and end, and it is especially helpful for students who need extra structure. Pictured here are just some of the task boxes I've created, including a vending machine practice kit, shape pattern and sequencing using APH materials, various locks I trial with students, and a number and clothespin matchup activity. Be sure to meet the sensory needs of your students and make adjustments to help them learn. For some students, this may mean that you play soothing music in the background, diffuse oils, brew coffee, or work with the student in a swing. You just have to find what works for each student. We all need cheat days, whether we're following a diet or as it relates to work. Don't feel guilty about using the first week or two to collaborate with teachers, touch base with students, and establish rapport rather than jumping right into working on goals and objectives. Plan for your first session as a time to encourage the student to talk about the excitement of the new year, new teachers and friends, fun activities they did over the summer, and discuss any concerns they have. Be ready to address any problems they are having with accessing the curriculum now. When addressing concerns, be diplomatic, professional, and kind. The steps you take now to establish positive relationships will help make for a smooth year. Also, unless it's against program policy, don't feel guilty about not rescheduling when a student or school cancels. Utilize that time to create activities or get caught up on paperwork. Also, remember it's okay to use a personal day and sick days. Your physical and mental health are important to your effectiveness as a teacher. Finally, don't feel guilty about canceling students to attend a conference. Remember, this will only benefit your students. If you are a new teacher or embarking on any new goal, remember it takes time. Change and learning new strategies doesn't happen overnight. Just like your weight loss efforts, your career growth may go through periods of plateaus or seem to be slow in progress based on extenuating circumstances. Pace yourself and just try to be consistent in your efforts. Always strive to improve and know small improvements are better than none. The worst thing you can do is to settle for subpar instructional techniques and strategies as this will only make things worse. Always strive to be a professional in all your interactions. This doesn't mean that you can't have fun and be yourself, but remember to be polite and choose your words carefully. Speak with kind words and use manners. Treat others the way that you want to be treated by being respectful and remembering to listen. Lead by being a positive example. Don't belittle others. Keep confidentiality. And remember, you never know who is related or who might be somebody's neighbor. There are three key characteristics of being a professional that are outlined in the five dysfunctions of a team. Be humble. Remember, there was a time when you didn't know either. Be complimentary of others and acknowledge your weaknesses. We all have them and you're not hiding it from anyone. Be hungry. Go above and beyond in your work and look for opportunities to grow. Finally, be smart. This doesn't necessarily mean book smart, but be smart about team dynamics and adjust accordingly. To be an effective TVI or vision professional, you need to have good in-person communication skills as you interact with so many team members. Dress like a professional. Not only will you feel better about the way you look, but others will be more inclined to treat you with respect. Be aware of your body language. This is a tough one for us introverts, but hold your head up and smile. Respect others' personal space as well as their time. Don't dominate a conversation and choose your words carefully. I prefer emails and texts to phone calls as I can refer back to conversations, but we all need to make phone calls. When you do, be sure to be respectful of other people's time. My cell phone is the best way to reach me, but I'm still cautious of who I give it out to. 
If you receive phone calls outside the workday, remember, it's okay to let it go to voicemail and return the call during your work hours. As itinerants, we don't always spend a lot of time in our offices. It can be helpful to have an office phone set up to deliver messages through emails. I have this feature on my office phone, and it minimizes the need to provide everyone with my cell number as messages are sent directly to my email. If you want to be viewed as a professional, your written communication must always be high quality. This includes your written reports as well as any email communication, progress reports, and IEP statements. Nothing looks worse than using poor grammar, the wrong name, or the wrong gender in a report. As you are writing any email, text, or report, always keep in mind that any form of written communication can be pulled and used during litigation. Stop and think if you would be okay with your email being read back in court. When I first entered the field, it was nice to have team members who were willing to proofread my reports. One of the especially helpful things my supervisor coordinated was to have all the TVIs serving students through the Governor Moorhead Preschool Program submit sample functional vision reports. It was so helpful to see different report styles and the way things were worded. Knowing how helpful that was for me, I decided to make some sample reports available for you to review. Pictured here is a cover to the sample functional vision reports that are available for free on my website. The final recommendation most self-help and weight loss programs will give you is to bulletproof yourself. This means setting yourself up for success so you avoid the pitfalls. With fitness, we are told to stretch before a workout, incorporate walks, reduce stress, stay hydrated, get enough sleep, and have an accountability partner, right? The same can be said for bulletproofing your career. Stretch yourself in ways that are outside of your comfort zone. Go for walks by attending conferences. Find strategies to reduce your stress and get enough sleep by balancing your work and home life. Finally, develop positive relationships and a network of colleagues that can challenge you to grow. No matter how long you've been in the field, remember there is always room for growth. Even seasoned professionals need to continue to learn. No one should ever stop learning or think they know it all. You are only fooling yourself. Remember that everyone makes mistakes. Use your mistakes as an opportunity to learn and grow in your knowledge. Use what you've learned from those mistakes to help others who may be going through the same situation. In this way, you can use what you've learned to become a leader and resource for others. It can be challenging to work in isolation. We are oftentimes singletons or the only vision professional in the area. For this reason, it's important to become the expert in your area. Seek opportunities for professional growth, build your resource library, join listservs and social networking sites and forums, and network with vision professionals at conferences. Okay, let's be real. Sometimes we are on teams that can be downright dysfunctional and toxic. You can't always avoid these situations, but you can choose to be the model of professionalism. You can do this by focusing on your job, being careful with all communication and maintaining high professional ethics. Whenever possible, keep your distance from toxic people. If your program vision team is toxic, focus on ways that you can grow professionally outside the team or program. Don't let the negativity keep you from excelling in your own career. Who knows, maybe your positive example will set an example to others. I can't stress enough the importance of surrounding yourself with the right people. Find teams to join or projects to work on with those who bring out the best in you and challenge you to grow as a professional. I won't deny that there are some real challenges with being itinerant and being in such a small field. We often feel like outsiders or the ugly stepchild within a school or program. Although that may not change, your perspective can change. Remember, we don't grow when things are easy. We grow when we face challenges. You will either become stronger or you'll die. Keep in mind that sometimes challenging roads, and I'm thinking of the white knuckle roads in many of our country's national parks, can lead to the most beautiful destinations. We should all strive to be the best versions of ourselves and contribute to the vision field. You can do this through grant writing, participating on professional learning teams, 
presenting at conferences or workshops, mentoring new TVIs, becoming duly certified as an O&M or CADIS, publish an article, software, or book, develop curriculum for the vision field, or participate in field testing. My final thoughts and tips for you are to be willing to serve all students on your caseload to the best of your abilities, learn strategies from other fields, collaborate and support all team members, multi-layer and scaffold your activities to challenge every student but ensure success, and most importantly, strive to be the TVI that teams and students want to work with. Here is a list of action items from this presentation. Print the year at a glance checklist for a reference of things you need to do. Create working folders for each of the students on your caseload. Work with teachers to create a schedule and don't forget to respect instructional time. Conduct the visit on each student to make sure you're providing the right amount of service. Organize your instructional assessment and office materials. Create a VI handbook, create your caseload at a glance, Conduct a self-assessment and the National Agenda Action Plan. Print the ECC Annual Needs Checklist. Balance caseloads if you're on a team and advocate for more TBIs or O&Ms if needed. Lesson plan and prepare instructional materials and make plans to attend professional development activities. If you are interested in checking out the ECC resources I created, you can find them on my website. In addition to free printables, I have published the TVI's Guide to Teaching the ECC and Supporting Grab-and-Go Workbooks. They are all PDF downloads that can be purchased with a credit card or purchase order. Thank you for joining me. I have listed here my school address along with my website address and email so you can connect with me.